Hello, everyone. I see people are still joining, but let me go ahead and kick us off since we have an exciting session today, and I don't want to take time away from our instructors. Um, welcome to the Bread IGC virtual course on environmental economics in low and middle income countries. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here again. Let me start us off with a couple of quick announcements, and then I will pass it over to hear about uh, regulation and pollution. Today is our topic. Um, we're delighted to have uh, Nick Ryan and Rohini Pandey here to present on this topic, uh, both joining us from Yale University. As a reminder, as in previous weeks, if you are interested in joining as a live panelist and having your video on and being able to interact a bit more, please do uh, put up your hand and we'll select uh, a few to join. Um, the second thing is the Q&A uh, box is available for you to, uh, to post your questions. Please do limit your use of the, uh, of the Q&A to kind of substantive contributions, whether they're, they're uh, questions or comments. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to remind you all of is uh, clocks change uh, for, for the fall in the UK for next week's uh, Thursday session. Depending on where you are in the world, your clocks may or may not be changing. So please just do double check uh, the, the time zone and make sure you're joining us at the right time next week. And so with that, uh, let me pass it on to uh, Nick. I believe you're gonna kick us off, is that right? Rohini? Excellent, all right, wonderful. Hi. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Kelsey, and thank you very much for having Nick and me uh, join. Um, I'm Rohini Pandey, and I'll be starting, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Nicholas at half an hour. So um, we're going to be talking today about the regulation of environmental externalities. And just to give you a sense of the outline, I'm going to start by talking a bit about you know, what are we trying to achieve with regulations and how may this differ in lower income settings? And then move on to the first constraint of thinking about how we may resolve agency problems. I'll then hand it to Nick, who will talk about monitoring and political economy issues and end with some thoughts on what we both see as really exciting areas for future research here. So, let me start by saying that while I'll certainly be talking uh, mostly about air pollution, I do think many of the issues that we think about in regulating air pollution apply more broadly to uh, thinking about greenhouse gases and climate change issues. And at a couple of places, I'll try to uh, bring out those parallels as well. So a starting fact, which is probably most of you are familiar with, is that if you look across the world, what we see is that you know, richer countries at this point have largely resolved their air pollution problems, while South Asia, China, and some parts of Africa have very high levels of air pollution, which is now seen as one of the leading causes of health issues across the world. And this is not because um, North America and Europe have less economic activity. Rather, it's a sign of the fact that they have very effectively used regulation to limit, for instance, uh, what industrial plants can emit or um, how cars can function in these countries. And we see this also when we look across cities, uh, where you see that the same fact, if you look at cities that have air monitoring systems, the US and Europe have largely resolved their problems. Um, in China and India, the two facts that st stick out both is level, cities with higher levels of pollution, which are certainly well above the WHO health standard, which actually has now come down from 10 to 5 micrograms, but actually above their own regulatory standards, which are often more lax. So to the extent that they're being more practical and saying, you know, we'll start with higher levels um, that we want to reach, they're not even managing to reach those. And again, just to draw an analogy, what we see across countries in terms of um, pollution and therefore health effects is paralleled when we think about climate change. So we know, and I think you've heard this uh, in earlier lectures, that across countries, the more vulnerable countries are those which start with being poorer. We see that for climate change, we see that for pollution, and we see that within countries as well, that countries within countries, poorer households are less able to adapt to climate change, but they're also less able to deal with the burden of air pollution. So these issues of 
And these are key issues why there then is a case for the state to enter as a regulator and try to affect economic activity in a way that ensures that there is not an unfair burden that falls on some citizens. So how have uh, environmental economists thought about this issue? It's clear that at the heart of it is the, is, the, is the basic issue of externalities that your economic activities are creating unpriced negative externalities on others. And you know, there's been a long uh, tradition of thinking about what is the right regulation. And clearly at the first best level, what you want to do is you want to price these externalities and you want to ensure that someone feels responsible for them. So for instance, uh, cap and trade markets, which we'll talk about a bit later, would try to address this by saying, uh, let's assign property rights over emissions, for instance, to industrial plants, and then let them trade, but they are responsible for their emissions. If that doesn't work, another alternative is to just directly price. It could be by using, say, carbon tax in the case of climate change or other forms of taxation. So, you could say, well, economist's job is done. It may be something about implementation now, but really we have identified what should be done. But if we turn to the sort of messier world of how this is implemented, we see that this is not as easily um, uh, implemented. So an example that I know you've heard about a couple of times in the lectures already is on crop burning, which uh, you know I have worked on with Kelsey and others, is that Around this time of the year, in fact, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see a lot of farmers in North India burning their um, stubble on their land in order to clear it for the next crop. And the effect of this is going to be on citizens 200, 300 miles down in Delhi, which is a very large number of citizens. Now, you may think that this is the classic problem where you want to just try to implement a Kosian solution of fully efficient trade. But we can see immediately the complications. So for instance, if you want to uh, have a system where farmers get a certain limit of what they can burn and then they have to trade above it, well, how do you identify the farmers? How do you get them the limits? How do you trade? If they have liquidity issues, how do you ensure that they pay for it? The government so has responded by thinking perhaps of a Piguvian solution instead of saying, let's put high fines. But again, you have to identify these farmers. You have to identify whether they've burnt this is hard to do because within a week, a burnt crop, a piece of land is going to look green again as it gets sown on. And so this is just one example of showing that this is, you know, in a decentralized environment, these kinds of solutions can be quite hard to implement. And Coase, in fact, right at the front, recognized this problem. He wrote that this argument has proceeded up to this point on the assumption that there are no costs involved in carrying out market transactions and goes on to talk about how it's both unrealistic and then he discusses the whole set of different things that we need to do. And in fact, in doing this, what he ends up doing is identifying a lot of the reasons why there are missing markets. And so if you were to just take that paragraph of courses and try to translate that into say economics 101, what are the kind of issues we are seeing? We're seeing um, some set of issues which are transaction costs, in courses language, which are how do you actually contract? How do you monitor individuals? Um, now, suppose you even set up the system and you perhaps have fines. Well, the person who's going to collect the fines may be a frontline worker who doesn't have the same incentives as their boss and are more willing to collude with farmers, let them burn and take a little bit of a cut on the side. Farmers themselves may not have the resources to pay, they may suffer from credit and insurance. And then finally, there is at the heart of it, a large political economy issue is why would the Punjab government even engage in such um, fines when the benefits are going to go to citizens in Delhi, which is under another jurisdiction. And just to be clear, these are not issues that don't come up in richer countries or higher state capacity countries. These are classic economic issues that arise across the world. But what makes them important and I think relevant for researchers to think about is that they may have a different effects both in terms of how high the costs are but also the solutions that you want to put in place and so what today Nick and I are going to do is going to draw out different examples from this empirical literature on regulatory enforcement to identify how these constraints in turn shape regulation.
And just to return once more to the links between uh, thinking about pollution or water um, issues and um, greenhouse gases, I just highlight both cases, we're going to see a set of interlinked challenges. So the way we've talked about within a country, and I think Nick will talk about this when he talks about water rationing, you know, individuals or groups within a country who suffer most from these, from say the effects of greenhouse gases uh, are often least equipped to deal with them. There's also clear links with governance. You're going to have high capacity governments that are going to be able to implement these policies and others that are not. And so when we start thinking about designing effective regulation, we want to think about what is feasible. Um, how do you actually get credibility in regulation? How do you deal with issues of weak information? And importantly, addressing these are going to be critical for solving political economy concerns, because it's only when you have credible regulation that is effective that citizens are going to see the worth of it. While all of this might sound like lower income countries start from a much worse place, there is some reasons to believe that as we see improvements in technology, there may be some ways in which lower income countries can actually leapfrog or do better in implementing um, you know, state of the art regulation. And we'll try to uh, talk about that as well. So let me now turn um, for the next 20 minutes to uh, more substantively talk about two ways in which we have worked on trying to uh, revise regulation and how they've actually helped resolve some set of agency problems. These are both um, papers that um, Nick and I have worked on together with our colleagues, Michael Greenstone, who you'll hear from next week. And uh, the first one is with Esther Duflo, who I think has already um, talked to you in the series. So I think you've seen, and Anand Sudarshan is another co-author of ours on the emissions trading work. So let me first put one uh, myth to rest, which is that uh, lower income countries do worse because they have less regulation. If you look across the world at just the extent of regulation, you can see that India and China have a lot of regulation on the books. India has over 140 environmental policy instruments in place. The problem is, I think, twofold. And this is brought up well by a quote from an ex-Indian prime minister who said, I must emphasize the standards are not enough. They must be enforced, which is difficult. So that's the first issue is how do we enforce? But then he also brings out concerns that I think relate to the credibility. It is also necessary to ensure that these standards don't bring back the license permit Raj, which we sought to get rid of in the wake of economic reforms of the 90s. And the license permit Raj was seen very widely as being associated with corruption, with bribes and a reduction in, in economic activity. And so I think as we think about designing and dealing with agency problems, you need to think about agency problems within the group of the regulators who are implementing them. And then also um, you know, agency problems that arise when say plants who don't want to be regulated, try to think about how they can possibly get around regulation by bribing the frontline regulator that they see. So just to give a bit more context, we're going to be talking about this in the context of a status quo, which is common across a lot of low income countries, which is command and control. So what this means is that the command is that the regulator will tell you in the case of air pollution, for instance, to install abatement equipment. And then the control is a standard that you have to reach about, for instance, how much emissions are you allowed to uh, have? In previous work, we've shown that um, both of that it's hard for the regulator in particular to ensure control. They can get the command in the place, they can get plants to install equipment, but it's hard for them to uh, have a bit of action. They, have, they don't have the ability, the staff to monitor. And this often means that they will regulate less. So Indian regulation is not unusual. Um, it was based very much on US uh, practices at the time of how um, laws were set in place. Um, they set at the federal or the national level and states are, are responsible for enforcing them. And the work I'll be talking about is with a long-term partner in Gujarat. Now, one of the classic problems that regulators across the world face, but certainly in a lower state capacity setting is inadequate staff. So they are unable to have enough staff to monitor. And this has 
as in other parts of public sector work has led to this question of can we do better by having public-private partnerships? And what we see is we see an increasingly important role being played by private third parties. Um, so uh, collecting data on emissions is something that someone who has a basic engineering training can do. So the idea would be let's Let's outsource by asking plants to directly hire auditors who will provide reports of emission levels that then will be sent to the government. And you can think of this as very similar to how uh, financials of companies are often audited, is that they get they get a company that will actually audit their, their, their finances and send in a report to the government. Increasingly, these auditors in environmental space are also important, for instance, in thinking about carbon offsets. But at the heart of it is a classic agency problem. If you have a firm hiring an auditor in order to um, report on them, but then the firm is also responsible for paying them, the auditor faces a conflict of interest. Do I provide the information that the government wants, or do I try to make sure that I have a job next year by providing the information that the plant wants me to transmit? And this again is not just true in environment. After the financial crisis, we saw exactly this issue for say the big four auditing companies uh, when it came to reporting on finances. So we're going to look at a reform that tries to address this issue. So we start with the status quo, which is the classic way that auditing works. The plant was responsible for hiring and paying the auditor who then takes the pollution readings to the regulator. And when we began, there was a clear perception that there was widespread shopping and the plants can buy the reports. And in fact, the courts had asked the regulator to come up with some modification. And I think as a research example, this is a good example of a place where we actually had a government that was very, a regulator that was very interested in credible evidence because they actually had to take it to the court. So what we did is we worked with them at scale to uh, implement an experiment, since that would give them the level of credible evidence that they could take to court, where we tried to fix two agency problems. So rather than having a firm choose the auditor, uh, the auditor was selected by the regulator from a set of certified auditors and assigned to a firm, and the rate at which the auditor would be paid was fixed. So there could not be any bargaining over the price between the auditor and the firm. In the second year, we also looked at performance pay incentives, but I'm going to talk about really the effects of the first two here. And I think the easiest way um, to sh show you the impact is really through a set of graphs. So what this graph shows you is for the status quo, so the control group where the auditor was paid by the firm. And um, the top panel shows you data from the report submitted by the auditor. So this just shows you what was the data on emissions levels they reported. The red line is regulatory standard, and you see a lot of stacking just to the left of it. So roughly 72% of them have you know, data which is under the regulatory standard, so they, are, they look like they're compliant. On the bottom panel, we have data that was independently collected by monitors who went and sampled um, air, and air samples at around the same time as the auditors were doing it, and you see a very different distribution. So there's no stacking around the regulatory standard. A lot more plants are violating. But importantly, we also see that there's some plants that are much cleaner than are being reported. So it's a classic sign the market had completely broken down. In contrast, now when we look at the same results for the treatment group, the top, the top panel is again is the reports given by the auditors. You do see some stacking, but it's roughly half the amount we saw in the control. And you see a lot more distribution. So this is information that the regulator can use effectively. You're seeing some that are non-compliant. And as we'll come to in just a bit, this is also uh, a place where there's, there, it suggests that there's a lot of heterogeneity in possibly the costs of abating across uh, plants. So our intervention was successful in changing the incentives of a, certainly a, a high fraction of auditors so that they started providing information that looked more closer to the truth. Now this matters to the extent that it actually affects firm behavior. So the final thing we did was we looked to see, do we actually see changes in pollution at the end of two years? And what we find is that pollution fell by 0.21 standard deviations. And so I think what this highlights is you can, you can think hard about an agency problem, come up with a solution to it, 
but you still need some other parts of the regulatory system to be working. The regulator was credible in that France believed that if they got the right information, they would punish the violators. And that led to these impacts. So this was a study done in India in the context of environmental uh, air pollution emissions. But I just want to end by kind of highlighting its, its value today. So as we know, most of the um, carbon offsets that we are seeing around the world is as a result of voluntary country commitments. And I think Kelsey has already talked to you in some detail about payment for ecosystems. Many of these are now being certified so that you can say that there was actually uh, carbon reductions took place. And there's been recently a lot of evidence suggesting that the same uh, conflict of interest affects the system, um, that auditors are, are certifying projects that were not effective. And we've actually seen kind of the price of carbon offsets has really crashed by over 80% over the last two years. And so this is, a, this is a point in time where I think the learnings from what we saw in air pollution audits are clearly going to be something that should be thought about in how you should be resolving these sort of structural conflict uh, issues if you're going to you know, recover the value of PES for carbon offsets. So now let me turn in the last, I think, eight minutes I have to uh, discussing emissions trading. So if you remember at the start, I talked about how one of the first best solutions you might try to have is to have some way of creating cap and trade systems. And we have, evidence that this works. Uh, some of the most well-known evidence comes from the U.S. acid rain program. So what you see here on the left-hand side for the United States in 1990 is really the distribution of power plants and the SO2 emissions. And you can see there's a lot of concentration of these plants on the eastern seaboard. Reflecting this on the right-hand side, you see um, the costs are also much higher on the eastern seaboard. Uh, these are the equivalent of what we would call acid rain or sulfur depositions, and there's a large uh, red amount on the east side. Recognizing the health and other costs of this issue, the, the trading program was started for SO2, where both the cap could be brought down over time to reduce the total emissions, but also uh, the hope was that this would lead to um, the highest, um, you know, low-cost abaters would just reduce emissions and others would trade. And what you see today in 2021 is the, the power plants, these are long-term investments, so these have not changed much, but you really don't see any longer these, this cost in terms of acid rain. And so, you know, this is extremely promising. And just to remind you, the value of emissions trading in a setting like the United States, where compliance with regulation is likely to be high, is that this is a low-cost way of abatement. And so uh, you would have plants being willing, more willing to do this because they can trade to make up, right? And again, coming back to greenhouse gases, you know, the EU ETS is a classic example of a very successful way of trying to reduce carbon emissions. But the concern is that when you turn to lower income countries like uh, India with low state capacity, the extent of lack of compliance we see with the status quo may suggest that we're just going to fail because you know they're not complying with status quo. Why would they comply with emissions trading? And so this idea that you can, you know, move towards a lower cost regime may be, um, you know, a pie in the sky if you're not going to get reduction, if you're not going to get compliance in the first place. So as you saw in Gujarat, when we started getting good information, we saw there was a lot of variation in uh, in emission rates. And this got the regulator as well interested in asking, could trading markets work? Here you can see at baseline, there is again, just a lot of variation. Um, this is the plants that entered our emissions trading market, which we evaluated and experimentally. And this would again suggest that there is a possibility to have gains from trade by allowing for a market. Um, for PhD students, I don't know if this is a positive or negative thing to say, but you know these are exciting projects that take a while. So you know, have a portfolio, and I think Nick can speak to it since I know he was the youngest of, and uh, uh, for the younger ones when we started. But you know, it's um, it, it, it sometimes things can seem like they'll take forever, but this is something that actually did work out. So also, like, don't despair. Um, we worked in Gujarat. We worked in Surat, which was an area where we had a lot of cluster textile plants. 
And so it was, we, could, we could have a single airshed on which the cap could be imposed. It was a randomized control trial. Most of these plants use uh, coal or lignite as fuel, and these are relatively large plants. Um, you know, the total uh, revenues were around 13 million for our population. So this is at some level, um, maybe not the result you would expect in a setting where the status quo has compliance, but I think it's an extremely important setting in a lower state capacity setting where the status quo was not able to get compliance. So what does this tell us? The blue line is emissions from the treatment group. The dotted line is uh, from the control group. You should look at the data release really starting period one, which is in October. Before that, uh, there were mock trades, but also people, the plants were coming on board with their continuous emissions monitoring system, which is why we see this uh, decline, which really reflects selection in, of plants into the sample over time. But what you see after period one is just the steady opening up of uh, roughly a 20% difference between emissions, between treatment and control. And this has stayed constant over time. And in fact, uh, now that the control group has moved into also the emissions trading, we've seen them come down by 20%. And so the first headline result we have is actually markets improved compliance. And this was a combination of having a credible regulator but also it being something that the, the building blocks, the market was such that uh, plants, once they agreed to trade, did trade to meet uh, lower emissions. Now, since emissions are different across treatment and control, we can't just use sort of survey results on cost to ask were there gains from trade in terms of also being um, a lower cost. And that really is generally seen as how an emissions trading system should be judged, does it reduce costs? But we were lucky in that we had access to the universe of permit bids. And if you think about it, at any single point in time, when a plant is making a bid to get more permits, it's going to do that for a given level of emissions um, in order to uh, abate, uh, in order to trade off between abating or buying another permit. And that, basic idea that a permit is your marginal abatement cost for a given level of emissions allows us to use the bid data to then get the abatement cost curves for the different plants. And then because the treatment control groups are similar, we can use these abatement cost curves to ask what would happen if we uh, reduce, if we held emissions constant and move from um, the status quo to the command and control and what we found was a cost reduction of roughly 15%. So we are able to combine these sort of experimental results that show us that emissions fall with the permit bid data to suggest that even that in a world where emissions remain constant, we do recover the promise of emissions trading markets being a lower cost way for plants to meet, um, meet their requirements. And I'm out of time, so I'll just, I think these numbers vary with the category you use, but I think unsurprisingly, no matter how much emissions reductions we think about, what we typically find is the health costs of particulate matters are high enough so that this is, this is an extremely cost-effective solution if we try to um, measure its worth, not in terms of gains from trade for the industry, but in terms of a broader question of what does it do for human well-being. And with that, let me hand it over to Nick. I'm going to, oh, sorry, one last thing let me say is that, you know, this has also been something that is, I think, um, a proof of concept has been very valuable. It's, um, we've seen our control group has moved into the emissions market. Uh, Ahmedabad, which is another large uh, area in, in Gujarat, which has a lot of plants, has started a market. And we're now talking to uh, Gujarat about extending it to other clusters. They are even thinking about how to have interlinked trade then between these clusters. And the neighboring state of Maharashtra, which is um, also very industrial, is starting a market in SO2 emissions. So now with that, let me stop share and hand over to Nick. Can't hear you. Nick, you're on mute. Hey, Nick, you're on mute. 
So great, I'm gonna pick off where Rohini um, left off and describe some particular instances of the trade-offs between uh, monitoring capacity and the type of regulation you might want to use. I tried to keep up with a few questions in the chat. I marked uh, a few um, that I think will be good for discussion afterwards. So we'll return to that. And after sort of half hour of my presentation, both Rohini and I will stay on to answer these uh, live questions and others that come up. So first I'm gonna talk about monitoring as a constraint, which is how do we even know what pollution is? You know, Before you regulate something, you have to be able to, to measure it. And the limits on the ability to measure pollution might be a reason why you adopt one regulatory regime or another. So just to give an example, if you want to measure emissions, for example, of nitrous oxides or volatile organic compounds or carbon monoxide from the tailpipe of a vehicle, this is basically the kit that you have to install. And it costs tens of thousands of dollars, uh, often more than the cost of the entire car itself, um, and you know, basically compromises the performance and you have no trunk. So it's obviously not a very popular option uh, to double the price of a car in order to implement a perfect Pigouvian tax. So then regulation for automobiles becomes a question of, well, we can't do the first best thing, which is create the missing market and tax the pollutant. So what should we do instead? And what I want to draw out here is that what we should do instead is extremely varied and a different set of regulatory tools has been tried in different places. And these tools, um, sort of each tool has its own sort of niche in the economics literature. And I just want to give you a bit of a tour of how the questions of individual economics papers correspond to the types of regulations that are being used and how these regulations might you know, make sense in some circumstances once you recognize that you can't monitor emissions. So if you can't monitor emissions, what you have to do is you have to regulate something which you think is related to emissions that causes emissions, but isn't necessarily pollution itself. So that could be the use of a car itself. And I'll show you an example of that. That could be the content of the fuel. So what kind of petrol or gasoline the, the vehicles are allowed to burn. Um, and that regulation happens upstream at the refineries that are producing it. It could be the technology that goes into a car. So I can't monitor emissions, but maybe I can monitor what types of cars are produced and make sure that kind of cleaner cars get, get made and get on the road. Or I could just monitor at spot checks. So instead of this continuous and expensive monitoring, maybe check on a car from time to time. And many countries do this, this is called a smog check. So once you leave the world of the first best instrument like taxing pollution or cap and trade, there are many different options that arise and all of them have sort of pros and cons. In general, the, the pros are, if you do a very coarse thing like monitor vehicle use, you might be able to do that very cheaply, but you're going to be far from regulating uh, the final emissions that you really seek to regulate. So you might uh, see this trade-off as between the ease with which you can monitor the cost of implementing the regulation and the potential benefits of monitoring something that are closer to uh, the pollution that is actually causing environmental harm. So just to give one example, starting at the very coarse end of the spectrum, again, we can't monitor the emissions from the tailpipe. So what we're gonna do instead is just say, you can't drive. And different countries have done this at different times. There are registration restrictions in, in China and Singapore. New Delhi has implemented this at times of peak pollution. One of the earliest papers here was by Lucas Davis about driving restrictions in Mexico City. And basically Mexico City had unbearable air pollution. So what they did was we can't monitor all these cars. We can't sort of regulate their emissions. We're just gonna ban a bunch of cars. And they implemented that by saying uh, on some days of the week, if you had an odd numbered license plate, you couldn't drive. Uh, and this seems sensible, well, maybe we'll cut emissions in half because they'll half, there'll be half as many cars. And what the Davis paper shows is the ban didn't work. Uh, and, and the reason, uh, it seems sort of mysterious, but it turns out to be straightforward, is that once you implement this ban on odd numbered cars, many people um, who could afford it would get an especially old and dirty car 
uh, and register that with an even numbered license plate so that they had two cars and they could drive them on different days of the week. And it turns out that this effect was large enough that aggregate emissions basically didn't move. And, and Davis shows this with a spatial regression discontinuity. So the regulation came into force late in 1989. And what you see around that time is there's very little apparent movement in, for example, nitrogen oxide um, ambient pollution levels. You can see there's a seasonal pattern. So every year there's a spike where uh, NOx goes up uh, in the winter, then comes down in the summer, goes up in the winter. And in the winter in 1989, 1990, it went up even a little more than you would have expected. So that's what the, the sort of break between the lines shows. Pollution was maybe about the same or maybe it even increased after this regulation went into force. And what Davis does very carefully is explain why this happened. And the, the critical piece of evidence is that after this regulation came in, people registered more cars. Um, and so you, you had a sort of increase in, in registrations and these were vehicles that tended to be older and dirtier uh, than the vehicles that weren't being driven because of the license plate restriction. So there's, there's similar sort of um, related follow-on papers from, from India and a little bit from China uh, showing that you know, these regulations aren't always totally ineffective as is the case here, but in general, because people have a lot of uh, ability to substitute away from uh, a strict sort of ban on vehicles to replace those vehicles or to get around it in some way, that can compromise their, their effectiveness as far as reducing pollution. So this is one example where if you take a very coarse regulation, you get very far from the thing that you wish to regulate, then people might be able to get around it. And that will undercut the, the rationale for having that regulation in the first place. Now I'm gonna give an, another example, again, sort of zooming in. Well, suppose that we tried this car ban and the car ban didn't work. What else could we do? Well, the cars are uh, emitting pollution in part because of the content of the fuel. And although sort of, you know, gasoline might all seem the same or, or petrol in some countries, uh, there are actually differences in the recipes for how this is produced in different places. And those different recipes cause different levels of emissions. In the United States, there are differences in these recipes, even across states. Um, and I, I'm going to sort of describe what these are, but basically at an abstract level, you want to think of these as a trade-off between flexibility and uh, sort of narrowing in on one particular part of the recipe. Uh, so for example, um, the federal regulations for fuel content are based on something called the vapor pressure. And this just measures all of the chemicals that are coming off of the fuel. So if you ever pump fuel at the, at the gas station, you have that rich kind of gasoline smell. Those are actually pretty harmful chemicals called volatile organic compounds. Um, and those have interactions with things in the atmosphere to cause ambient air pollution, especially ozone. Uh, and so those regulations at the federal level basically said you can't have that the sum of all of these chemicals is more than a certain amount uh, in, in the content of the fuel. California, which is generally more aggressive in its environmental regulation said, ah, what we care about is not just the sum of all of these regulations, rather it's these particular parts of the recipe uh, that are especially likely to cause air pollution. And so they have a RFG, a reformulated gasoline standard that's much more specific to one part of these VOCs. And this comes up with different kinds of pollutants where you might think I've nailed the pollution problem, but in fact, that pollutant contains several components and those components are not all equally damaging. So this is just a map showing the pattern of regulations across the United States. The main point of the map is there are several different colors. Uh, California has its own colors. Uh, in particular, uh, they have this um, more specific targeted, targeted reformulated gasoline standard whereas most uh, other states uh, following the federal standard have these RVP or vapor pressure standards, which are more general and don't apply to the specific pollutants uh, that are most damaging. So what happened is after these regulations came into force, um, there's not a line on this graph, but for California, it happened in 1996. You saw the CARB counties, that is counties in California under the California Air Resources Board, saw their daily ozone levels come down very sharply. This is the dashed line at the top on the left, uh, which is moving down from left to right. 
The other counties, the RFG counties that started with these reformulated gasoline standards, it doesn't look like much happened. Uh, there's this sort of gray line, which is moving up and down, and it kind of continues moving up and down uh, from left to right. So this is just the raw data. It's a good practice to, to start out a paper showing just the raw data. Even in more sophisticated econometric analyses, what Alfhammer and Kellogg find is that only these California standards were effective. And they attribute this to the fact that the other standards were, in a sense, too flexible. They allowed people to reduce the overall content of VOCs, but it didn't compel them to take out the parts that were most damaging. And therefore, they did the least costly thing, which was not necessarily the most effective thing. So this is a contrast between the, the case Rohini presented, measuring PM, where we're sort of confident that that's a tradable commodity, versus measuring VOCs, treating these VOCs as a commodity, even though they're not really doing the same thing or causing the same environmental damage. Uh, as a kind of postscript to this episode, uh, you can see after uh, th these sort of standards are implemented in California, that the price of gasoline is consistently higher in California than in other states. Uh, and that's because it's not free to form cleaner gasoline. Uh, the refining process is sophisticated and you have to make changes to that process that are expensive. And, and moreover, since 2015, there's been a further increase in the price of gasoline in California relative to the rest of the country. And that's attributable in part to these standards because once you have a separate regulatory regime, a stricter regime in a given place, that market becomes separate and the price for that fuel is no longer the same as the price for fuel in other places. So if you wanted to do a benefit cost analysis of this regime, you would have to compare the decline in damages from ozone pollution against the additional money that Californians have to pay to drive their cars. So this is a, another sort of example where, okay, we, we've tried uh, regulating the cars themselves, just forcing the cars off the road, that didn't work. We've tried these fuel content standards. Maybe we got it right um, in the case of California, but it was very costly to do so. Uh, we could also try just measuring emissions at one point, for example, when the car was produced, and then seeing, uh, did that reduce emissions over the lifetime of the vehicle? And this is the approach of a, of a recent paper in the QJE by Jacobson, Salih, Shapiro, and Van Bentham, that looks at sort of regulation of new vehicle standards. And one reason this is beneficial is that you don't have to monitor the whole uh, sort of history of emissions once a car is produced as it's driving around the city and so forth. You just have to check it once, see that it meets a standard and then say, okay, you can, you know, can go out on the road and, and drive wherever. So what they show is that these new vehicle standards definitely have brought down new vehicle emissions rates enormously over time. So the US started these in, in the 60s even, uh, they tightened them in the 80s and again in the 1990s. And what you see in the left-hand graph is the level of the standard for each tightening of the nitrous oxide uh, emission standard for cars and trucks. So trucks are the, the red dotted line. They have a higher standard. They're treated more leniently than, than passenger cars. And both of them sort of step down uh, over time to much lower levels uh, in, the, in the 2000s. And on the right-hand side, you see the corresponding measurement of emissions rates for new vehicles, both for cars and trucks. And you can see that these are sort of marching down um, even lower levels. The scale here is even lower. So in fact, uh, when the cars are new, manufacturers are over compliant. They're going even below the standard that was set. And the authors show evidence that uh, this sort of downward march of the standards has made new cars vastly cleaner. What they also show, however, is that once a car gets on the road, it tends to get dirtier and dirtier over time. So for example, if you look at the carbon monoxide panel in the upper left and consider the oldest cars for model years before 1992, this is the top um, line, the sort of blue line, solid one. So they start out at about eight grams per mile. And then this graph is on a log scale. So by the time a car is 16 years old, for example, it might be at 25 or 30 grams per mile. So it's effectively doubling as the car ages over time. Uh, and this happens for each vintage of cars. So as you move down the line, 
the newer cars are cleaner, but the newer cars also degrade over time. And the reason for this is pieces in the engine break down, the catalytic converter gets gummed up, and overall the sort of technology that's put into the cars becomes less effective over time because you're only regulating the new vehicles. So what they show is because of this pattern, just regulating new vehicles uh, actually only checks a, a relatively small part of the total emissions in the vehicle fleet. So this graph is the fraction of emissions from vehicles of a certain age. So for example, at age eight, you can see uh, vehicles that are eight years old or younger um, only emit about a quarter of the carbon monoxide. That means three quarters is coming from the older vehicles, which are effectively not regulated and degrading over time. So they analyze this policy and find basically it has very high benefits, but because it's omitting this regulation of the older vehicles, it could still be vastly improved if there were some taxation introduced to induce people to move these older cars off the road. Okay. Uh, and you know, of course, people regulate that as well. I won't go through in as much detail, but the way to do that is through what's called a smog check, which is you have to check that the old cars aren't getting too dirty over time. Um, Paulina Oliva has a nice paper looking at the smog check in Mexico City and effectively showing that people are able to circumvent this as well. Uh, the reason is basically the agency problem that Rohini discussed. If you're a smog check station, you can do better by being lenient uh, than by being very strict. And so these stations effectively substitute clean cars when someone brings in a dirty car in order to give them a, a free pass. So the, the bottom line, what I want you to get from this review of what's going on in transportation is that once you can't do the first best regulation, uh, the space of possible regulations becomes much bigger. You could regulate cars, you could regulate technology, fuel, uh, monitor on the road, monitor off the road, do spot checks. And each of these has their own costs and benefits. And the costs and benefits of these policies differ dramatically depending on the ability to monitor and the capacity to implement these different regulations. And that's why we see different places adopting different combinations of these policies. So it's really about sort of seeing the forest. And then once you see that sort of policy forest, you can also see the kind of corresponding uh, sort of research literature, which is effectively uh, looking into the efficacy of these alternatives and trying to identify in which cases will one or the other work better. So that's one kind of constraint, which is on monitoring. I now want to turn to talk about a political economy, and I'm going to focus on this case of groundwater depletion, which I think was, you know, again, mentioned before in this series, but I'm going to use it to illustrate how do we measure the sort of loss from an inefficient regulation? How do we sort of bear down and get estimates of the social cost of using a regulation that is not uh, really efficient or giving people efficient incentives? And the case I'll look at is uh, sort of groundwater depletion from my paper with Anand Sudarshan. So this is a massive, uh, massive problem in India. Uh, India is using more groundwater than the US and China put together. And the US and China are both extremely large users. There's effectively um, no formal groundwater policy. There's no price on groundwater. There's no property rights on groundwater. You can't you know, um, sort of trade it over any scale. You can trade a little bit with your neighbor, but, but hardly beyond that. Uh, so the, the effective policy in India is rationing. Uh, and, and the rationing is, is brought about through the electricity grid. So farmers use groundwater uh, by running electricity pumps to pump it up to the surface. You basically can't get uh, groundwater without using electricity. And what the governments in many states do is they just limit the power supply to farmers saying you can only have six hours or you can only have nine hours or you can only have four hours a day in order to limit fat farmers power use. And in this paper, we show that that is an effective limit. So the graph to the right here shows that the, the top one, the daily hours of supply are strictly adhered to. Nobody gets more than about six hours. And at the bottom, that that effectively limits farmers power use. Nobody can use more than about six hours. And so they can't use more water because the government is cutting off the electricity. Now, the thing about this that's potentially inefficient is there might be some farmers who have an extremely high value of water. 
So imagine that you know your crop is just at the brink of failure and you need to irrigate it more to keep it alive, you could lose the entire value of your output just for not being able to increase your, your water consumption a little bit. So for some people, this could be very, very costly. And for other people, it might be that giving them you know, six hours of, of free water is too much and they're just wasting. You know, they, they don't have any incentive to conserve. And so oh, I'll just use six hours because uh, it's free up till that point. And so what we do in this paper is try to measure to identify uh, what is the value of this water to farmers. And the idea is that farmers are using this water in agricultural production. And so we can get the value to farmers by measuring the profits that they make when they use more or less water. So the, the, what the farmer is doing, we represent this as their profit maximization problem. They're choosing their inputs like labor, capital, and H, which is hours of pumping, uh, in order to maximize their profits. And their hours of pumping, their H, is limited by this H upper bar, which is the ration. So if I pump for H hours, I get an amount of water, which then goes into my crop. And that you know, amount of water is sort of dictated by physical rules, the size of my pump and how far down underground the water is, DI. So if the water is very deep, then for a given amount of pumping, I get less of it on the surface. And therefore, you know, I won't get as much water, even if I have six hours of electricity to run my pump. So you can write these um, sort of production and profit functions just as if the farmer is choosing water and optimally choosing all of the other inputs given their potential water choice. So this is just to say, collapse these functions to a one-dimensional object where the, the production and the profit are envisioned to depend only on water and trust that the farmer is doing the right thing for all of the other inputs as they use more or less water. If all of the farmers are acting like this, then what the state is thinking about in setting a ration is, imagine I increase H bar a little bit. What will happen? So two things will happen, and even three things will happen. So one is, you know, farmers are going to get a little bit more water because I've given them six and a half hours instead of six hours. So then this WI for all of the farmers is going up. Therefore, they're making more profits. So farmers' pi I is increasing as well. And if we think about this like a typical economic production function, probably the more water I give them, the less their profit is increasing. So at first, they need some water to crop at all. So their profit is increasing very steeply. Uh, but then as I give them more and more water, uh, the, the marginal returns to that are decreased. On the other hand, uh, the state has to pay for this additional pumping. This is the CEPI H bar. And there's a sort of social cost to the other farmers from any given farmer using water. We represent that as this delta W. This is the effect that the groundwater table is decreasing. And so as you're increasing pumping, you're taking out water that some future farmer or some other farmer could use. And so when the state thinks about this, what they want to do is to balance the, the marginal benefit to the farmer, which is the increase in profits that all of these farmers will gain from an increase in water against the social cost, which is the cost of the electricity and the, the sort of opportunity cost of the water, that is that somebody else uh, in the future is not using. And what you can kind of see here, even in this expression, is that you could set an H bar to balance these two sides, but it's still going to be inefficient. So the best H bar, which is the best uniform level of water for everybody, is still inefficient relative to if you could give the right level of water to each individual farmer. And the reason is this d pi i dh, the marginal return to water is different for some farmers. Some farmers have a very productive farm and they're heavily constrained. They could do more with the water. Other farmers are just spilling it and wasting it and they have a very low marginal return. So the best H bar is still not the best policy in the whole space of, of possible policies. So what we do um, just to sort of accelerate is we basically estimate this marginal return by using variation in depth across space uh, to predict farmer profits. And what we find is that when well depth is greater, that is when farmers get much less water, their profits decline very steeply. 
So a one standard deviation increase in depth, which is in our sample, 187 feet. So if the water goes down 187 feet, the profit of a farmer will go down by 14% of household income. So this is a, a huge amount uh, just from a single input factor in, in agriculture. And we can then use this estimate to say, well, is the state getting the ration right? And what we find is that the benefit of increasing the ration, that it's allowing farmers more water, is about 2,000 rupees per hectare, uh, which is this bar on the left-hand side. And the cost of that is uh, the sort of gray bars on the right. The bottom segment of the bar is that cost of, of additional electricity you have to pay for. And the white part are different estimates of the social value of the water in the future, corresponding to different discount factors. So if you put this in a single number, you could say, depending how patient you are, um, if your discount factor is about uh, 0.82, like an interest rate of 18%, then the state is getting the ration about right. Uh, but what the paper goes on to show is that, again, because even if you're choosing the best H bar, this is not the best policy because all the farmers have the same H bar. And so if you allowed farmers to have different prices, uh, you would get very different responses because the productivity of farmers is very different. And this graph shows essentially the dispersion of the shadow cost of the ration. You can think of the shadow cost of the ration as how much each farmer would profit if the ration was increased from six hours to a little more than six hours. Uh, and what you can see is that that's widely dispersed. Some farmers would benefit a lot, some farmers would benefit only a little. So even though the state is getting the ration right on average, people have very different returns from increasing their water use. And therefore, this, this policy is still very inefficient. In fact, if you could implement a pricing policy, you would increase profits by about 12% of mean income. So again, this is like a very sort of large inefficiency. And the next and kind of final question we ask, which relates this to the political economy is, well, if this is so costly, why don't they just price the electricity or price the water? And this is a case, unlike the case with transportation, where Plainly, that is feasible. Many people have their electricity metered. It's not as if the technology to do that doesn't exist. And so what, what we find is that the main constraint on this is likely to be equity concerns, that the farmers that would benefit most from pricing water are farmers that are already relatively large and productive. So I'm going to just skip briefly um, to the conclusion here from some, some final notes. Um, regarding directions for future research. So we've given a bit of a whirlwind tour of literature on environmental regulation. The main theme we would like you to take away is that most of the regulations used in practice, and therefore most of the regulations that people studied, are not what we would call first best or efficient regulations. And because of that, most of the research is oriented around questions like, what are the constraints on uh, implementing the first best? For this regulation that's actually used, what are the benefits and costs? What is the efficiency loss relative to if you were able to do something efficient? And what are the gains that are feasible from reform? Um, and I think the, the research we've highlighted has a few features. One is that they, they have a clear sort of institutional knowledge of the motivation of the regulation. What is it targeting? What is it trying to do? Often they have exceptional data. And more recently, uh, there's often an emphasis on sort of policy variation or quasi-experimental variation to try to estimate key parameters like uh, the return to relaxing the ration or the abatement cost of an industrial plant. Um, and just in the, the final minute to, to kind of conclude, where do we see this going? So one obvious um, direction is that there's just a huge world of data which has not really been exploited. And I think this the benefits of increasing data are probably differentially large for work on lower income and middle income countries. Basically, a lot of work um, in environmental regulation has been weighted towards the US to a lesser degree towards Europe. In part, that's because those places have been monitoring pollution for a longer time and have more regulations on the books to study. But the availability of remotely sensed data, um, personal monitoring data from even cell phones and things like this, can actually open up the study of regulation in countries that don't have uh, the strongest monitoring networks on their own. 
another sort of um, important interaction is that, you know, as Rohini mentioned, we expect that in many low and middle income countries, there are pre-existing market failures, such as these agency problems or credit constraints, for example, um, that are already widely studied in development economics, but which are not really appreciated for the interaction they might have with the optimal environmental regulation. So I think a, a kind of very active and interesting area is how is the, the right regulation, the sort of most constrained efficient regulation changing in different environments, depending on which of these constraints are most important. Um, so with that, I will, I will stop and we'll open it up to, to questions and we're both going to, to be here to um, field the questions and start a conversation. Brilliant, thank you so much, Nick and Rohini. Um, we can start with our live participants. I know that there are also some great questions in the chat. So Karina, why don't we start with you and uh, then we'll go from there. Um, first, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this lecture is particularly interesting uh, given my thesis topic, my doctoral thesis topic. I'm going to try to be as precise as possible. Um, I know that this is always a problem. Uh, so first is what we saw, we saw a lot in our uh, lecture today, regulation, but from a very um, sort of negative regulation perspective, right? So you want to constrain pollution. So a lot on like brown and green, gray agenda type uh, oriented regulation. But I wanted to know from the professors if there has been study regarding sort of green and blue agenda type regulations where it's more from a maybe um, positive reinforcement type ideas instead of a cost um, idea. And then I also wanted to know from the from the professors, um, agency problems regarding federative designs. So um, a lot of um, the examples given, you had sort of local governments um, and, the, and the, even in the states, but you have like local governments um, with their own sort of priorities or uh, policy priorities and how, how how can you integrate sort of agent federative a agency issues into this um, issue also um finally um or the final two very specific points is one do you do the professors see um research integrating new technology to try to monitor so um environmental issues so for example um in brazil I know we have a strong where we are, sorry, our carbon market is voluntary and we do not have any type of government enforced type of financial support saying these operations are um, actually reducing emissions. And then finally, you have a lot of instruments already set in place. So for example, the Red Plus program already exists and you have a lot of that going on towards emissions, but now we're talking about carbon markets and then we're also talking about carbon taxing. So I'm, I was wondering from the professors if they've seen studies regarding sort of second, third or fourth four, or four type best um, regulatory tools and how that, that they're being compared in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Thank you very much. Carol, do you want us to collect questions or just answer as you go along? Um, let's start with those four and then we can go to the chat. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds good. I, I'll just answer a couple and then I'll hand it to um, Nick on that. And thank you. That was a real two or four questions which uh, covered uh, many things. So. Um, just in terms of um, the sort of how do you have positive reinforcement, I think you can think of, uh, you know, many of the red plus policies or, you know, paying to not deforest as positive reinforcement. You're trying to encourage a certain type of don't cut down trees or don't do things. So those would become under, I think, kind of these sort of payment for ecosystems, I said a red plus, and I think where it um, interacts with our lecture today is really thinking about some of the kind of agency problems that you need to resolve, right? So I think for any of these even positive um, programs, what's going to be critical is being able to verify the actions that are happening. 
And I think a lot of the discussion has been on the legal side, on the design side, but not enough on how to actually design credible verification. And I think we're seeing the costs of that in the carbon offset market right now. So I really think that's a first order issue that needs to be resolved. The second thing that I think Nick ran out of time on, but I think if the slides, full slides are post up, you'll see is, on this issue of the political economy of dealing with um, with um, uh, with implementation of federal setting where you decentralize down to local governments, there's a lot of evidence. And in fact, I think the example Nick was going to talk about was from Brazil, where you do see that uh, you know municipalities understandably want to uh, you know reduce pollution in their area, but also increase economic activity and therefore don't care so much about outcomes in others. And so I think that goes back even to the old theorem about how there's a real trade-off in decentralization between letting local communities, which may have better information, may have different preferences to choose versus sort of centralizing on um, how to deal with environmental standards. And I think that is, as we would say, is an evergreen area of trying to find examples of how you deal with it. I think we know quite a lot about, I'd say, the costs. We know a little bit less about the benefits in terms of local communities maybe having better soft information. Um, and I think that's something that Oates talked about, but I think hasn't received so much attention. But let me hand it to Nick now to continue. Um, yeah, so I appreciate the, the questions. I'll just like um, comment on two of them. So on the green and blue versus gray, so yeah, we um, definitely took a focus here about directly regulating the pollution emissions coming out of existing dirty technologies. There's an entirely you know, different tack, which is you know, forget about the tailpipes, forget about the factories, we're just gonna you know, push and innovate and have you know, electric vehicles plugged into solar panels. And so we won't have to worry about this at all, which is like subsidizing for different technologies that will have full benefits in terms of reducing these um, local pollutants as well. So that is a is a road that's also active. We think it's like covered um, in some of the other you know, lectures to an extent, but definitely when doing any kind of policy evaluation or analysis, one should consider, you know, what are the outside options? Is that, you know, is it best to regulate the technology that's in place to mandate or push to some new technology? And I think that that, that will also be an empirical question in different settings. It's becoming more relevant now because for example, electric vehicles are reaching a place where some countries are you know, pushing them or you can only have an EV in the city center and whatever. I think for now, those are going to be relatively high cost and they're not going to be substituting for this um, regulation of traditional or, or gray pollutants. And then, yeah, I just would echo, I agree entirely with what Rohini said in the carbon markets that I think that these um, problems of second, third and fourth best regulation are rife there. And the only reason the literature is not similarly broad and rife is that we just don't have as much experience to study and draw on. And in five years or in 10 years, uh, that thing will you know, be expanding and there'll be a lot more evidence hopefully produced by you, know, you all and, and people working now. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat that have been uh, thumbs up quite a bit. So maybe we can touch on those. The first, Nick, I believe you saw it was, um, I can just read it. Uh, even market-based mechanisms require adequate monitoring. For example, ensuring firms aren't exceeding their allowances or sending tax bills. Monitoring tends to be quite weak developing countries, Pakistan as a classic example. How do we think through this problem when the provincial environmental regulators might not have the capacity or resources for monitoring and enforcement? And then a second question, where we can lump these um, talked about groundwater extraction, um, seeming to assume aquifer recharge. And the question is about how formulating the problem as a dynamic optimization problem would affect the results, especially given the interplay between climate change and water supplies. So, Rohini, do you want to field the first one and I'll do the water one? Sure. So I think um, you're exactly right. I think it's going to be critical to have uh, good information. I think that for any market, if you don't have information to know what people are doing. And so here's a place where I think there is actually promise. We saw in India that now you have continuous emissions monitoring systems um, that can be put in place for PM. 
In fact, for greenhouse gases you may, or for carbon trading, you may be in a slightly better place because very often you'll have just, you, you still have to care about process emissions, but emissions inventory. So knowing, for instance, how much coal a plant is using tells you quite a lot about their carbon use. So I think a critical part of setting up markets in any setting, but particularly low income countries is going to be to deal with data acquisition systems. How are you going to handle the data and how are you going to keep it credible? And some of the issues that we talked about, about third party auditors would come in place here. We've certainly seen that in our setting is that for instance, you need to have calibrated um, data collection systems for emissions. That calibration, you don't want the plant to be fully in charge of, otherwise they'll calibrate it to make sure that they always look like they have essentially no emissions. So I think um, absolutely agree with you, but I think it is feasible. And I think this is a place where the combination for carbon of the nature of the good and for particular matter or for SO2, um, just the way we can now measure it makes it feasible for countries like Pakistan and India that do have the basic technical capacity. Nick, over to you. Yeah. Um, so regarding the groundwater recharge, so in the manner I presented it, um, I was thinking about a static problem, which is just how much electricity and therefore how much water do you want to use today? But in that sort of lambda parameter, which is hidden there, it, that parameter actually values the, the sort of loss of the water in the future and was estimated in a separate dynamic problem. So the question is basically, is this neglecting um, the value of the water and the fact that the water table is declining. Um, so we do estimate that and incorporate that in the social value of water. One thing that's kind of interesting, if you look at the data, in some arid and semi-arid areas, the groundwater levels are declining maybe a meter in a decade. Um, so they, they are going down. Um, but there's a, a self-limiting aspect to that, which is that the further the water goes down, the harder it is to pump to the surface. And so one of the things that came out of our model was that, well, groundwater is declining a lot. It's still not even close to the, the steady state. And in many of these areas, you should expect it to continue to decline until it reaches this point where it's almost impractical to, to still lift the water to the surface. And so I think that transition path, how that happens, the effect on the people on the surface, how they migrate or, or move in response to the loss of water, these are all kind of very interesting questions. And there's a sort of interaction um, between the big questions about climate change and then the microeconomics of adaptation and how people respond to these, these shocks. Thank you. Um, we'll swing back here to the panelists. Uh, I see that there's one question. Uh, Katessa, do you want to ask? And could I just ask you to keep it brief if possible? And then we can yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, environmental um, regulation is actually very important. Uh, my point is that in Africa, basically, the economy is more of agriculture. So um, is there any specific regulation that might work for a specific sector like uh, agriculture? And then uh, some of the examples that we have seen now are basically household level or more of them are cross-sectional. So, is there um, a policy or environmental regulations that might work for like East Africa, West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, or a regional type of environmental regulations that can actually uh, abide um, some countries in the like? Thank you very much. I can start in that hand to Nick. So thank you for the question. I think especially I think mentioning agriculture is critical because I agree with you that's extremely important. And I think you can take some of what Nick was talking about, for instance, with water regulation as I think part of thinking about it, because as climate change is happening, I think that's going to be one critical input we're going to see. Another one that we didn't talk about, but I think is re relevant is thinking about certification or regulation of the kind of inputs that go into agriculture. It's not necessarily so much about environmental externalities, which is why we didn't bring it up. But if you think about productivity, uh, one of the concerns is very often is the kind of, um, say, the quality of the fertilizer or other inputs you're getting are going to matter a lot. And that's certainly something that regulators will think about. So I think your question is also good to remind us that very often when we think about regulation, something like agriculture, it's not just for environmental externalities, it can also just be for the goods that you need to use. And they can often have upstream consequences because, you know, fertilizer does use different inputs that we may be concerned about. 
Nick, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think the um, one other aspect is the land use component and sort of external benefits from land use. So this has been, I think, in, in Kelsey's work um, and in others' work, a real focus and something we probably don't have great precise estimates of the external benefits of land use. For example, um, obviously the carbon storage, but then the sort of rainwater um, induction effect you know, in the Amazon, people speak of deforestation actually reducing the amount of rainfall because the moisture retained in the vegetation is less. Um, these kind of feedbacks are basically themselves externalities. And the implication of those is that you would probably want to subsidize some land uses and tax others to the extent that they had these external benefits or costs. Um, I think there's a lot of work in like ecology and things like this, trying to study the nature of those or the mechanisms for those, but there's much less in like economics trying to say, okay, what is the value of those? Or could we measure the economic value on neighboring plots? You know, people have a sense that you know, clear cutting is bad, but uh, can we quantify that? And so there's work like, you know, Alan Shao studying the palm oil uh, plantations in Indonesia, you know, Kelsey's work on tree plantation in Malawi, um, there's some work in the United States on the value of protection from wetlands. And basically all of these are different kind of environmental services which represent externalities. And so the right approach to that could be a you know, subsidy support problem, uh, program, could be a, a regulatory program, and it really depends on the nature of those. But I, I think we just have a lot that we don't know about the, the valuations, especially of these services and which ones are the most important. And... and with that, I think we'll wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Ruhini and Nick, for an excellent lecture. A reminder that next week, uh, we will have a lecture from Tama Carlton and Reed Walker on the inequality of environmental damages. And London time is having its daylight savings, so it will be one hour different, just to mark your calendars. Um, if nothing else, then thank you, and we'll see you next week very much.